Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, today I'll be briefly talking about Zygmunt Bauman's book, Globalization, The Human Consequences. Uh, I'm teaching this uh, book next week in my graduate seminar, so I thought I should do this brief uh, video by way of an introduction. Uh, I've used this book before and I've found that uh, it is slightly different from other books on globalization because it gives us both an economic explanation but also political and philosophical explanation of the uh, concept of globalization and its unfolding across the globe. And Bauman starts in his, in, in his introduction by introducing globalization as this dominant concept that everyone has an opinion about and everyone tries to explain but as more people try to either talk against it or write in favor of it, the concept itself uh, becomes pretty fluid and its definition and acceptance or rejectance, re rejection gets connected to whatever the politics or the preferences of, of the people employing the concept are. So in the introduction, he theorizes or introduces this important um, concept which he finds is deeply pertinent to, to the 20th and 21st century, but also to the concept of globalization, and that's the question of mobility. So according to his reading of globalization, the system, the economic system in place, uh, its core accomplishment or core aspiration for people is to have the power to move. Right, And if that is the core accomplishment or the core promise of globalization, then the global elite tend to share this capacity to move. They can move from anywhere part of the world to another. There are less restrictions on them, on them and hence they can all pretty much share the actual promised uh, you know, claims of globalization. But on the other hand, this ability to move so freely across the globe also comes face to face with the inequalities that are created by the system of globalization, and that is the lives of the people who remain trapped in the local. So while globalization claims that the world has become a village and everyone can move freely, at the same time, the lives of those who do not have the capacity to move or do not have the possibility to move from one part of the world to another or within the country if they are trapped within their location, they are the ones who deal with the consequences of globalization. So one of the examples would be a global corporation could come into your con country, could, could go into any part of your nation uh, and do whatever work they need to do and then leave, but whatever consequences, ecological, environmental, and economic, they leave, the local populations have to de deal with that. So Zygmunt Bauman then hopes and desires to explain, first of all, and it is, this is it consistent with his other body of work, is, is not just how the lives of these globally mobile elite are created and structured, uh, but what happens to those who are left behind, who are fixed in place, and who have to deal with the localities? He actually suggests that part of the rising fundamentalism that we see in so many far-flung areas of the world is, is not just integral to those cultures, it's actually a direct product of globalization. So he lays down his, in, in his introduction what he attempts to do in the chapters that are included in the book. Uh, and one of them I find really interesting, but in the first chapter he says the link between the historically changing nature of time and space and the pattern and scale of social organization. So that is where the space-time compression, the concept of how as we move into modernity and beyond that, how the means of mm, communication, means of travel has have re revolutionized, time itself has been compressed, and what are the consequences of that 
for for the globalized world uh, is it really good for everyone or is it good only for those who have access to that space time compression and not necessarily good for all those who are fixed in place so that's what he discusses in the first chapter uh, and its scale uh, within that he also discusses what he calls the absentee lordship now you, we all know that the concept of the absentee lordship comes from early definitions of capital, early discussions of capital, and that happens uh, literally in the feudal system when the landlords owned the land in the country but never really lived there and ran it either through intermediaries or through managers. It happened in the colonies too, especially in India, where people made enormous wealth during the times of the East India Company by being absentee landlords, right? And that way they were detached from the everyday exigencies of life in India, right? Uh, they were secure from any physical or other threats to their self, but they had, through their intermediaries, the possibility and the power to extract wealth and resources. Similarly, under global capital, then, a new form of absentee landlordism has been initiated, where uh, wherever you live in the world, you never really know who owns the company that you're working for, how did they get there, who did they bribe, what kind of uh, re a contract did they get from your government, because these multinationals have immense power and they can extract the kind of contract that they want from any nation state, especially if they are not part of the powerful North Atlantic uh, industrialized nations. And even there, these corporations still act as absentee landlords. And so that's the concept that he discusses in that. In chapter two, um, besides other things, he also gives us a really, really an acute understanding of the concept of the panopticon. Now, those of you who are familiar with uh, Foucault and Jeremy Bentham already know that Foucault builds on Jeremy Bentham's concept of the panopticon. And the basic premise of that was that uh, Bentham, being a utilitarian or consequentialist believed in prison reform. But his idea was that the, the, if we structure the prisons a certain way, if we construct them a certain way, we don't need to supervise the prisoners all the time. So if you build a guard tower that the prisoners cannot see, right, then the prisoners would assume, and that would be in the shape of a panopticon, the prisoners would assume at all times that they are being watched. And if they are being watched, they themselves would regulate their own behavior. They would internalize the gaze of power in their souls, so to speak. And then when Foucault talks about the concept of the panopticon, the idea is that we all already internalize the discourse of power wherever we exist, and we modulate our behaviors accordingly. And sometimes it's so deeply embedded in us that even when we are free, when we are told you're free to go, we do not know what to do. Because we have internalize the logic of the power that dictates uh, our actions so deeply that we cannot function without it. And now for Zygmunt Bauman, he says that uh, the purpose of radical and liberal philosophy used to be to get rid of the panopticon, but in the modern world, in a globalized world, actually everyone wants to become part of the panopticon. Everyone wants to be watched, included, recorded, because so much of what we do depends on it. I mean, think of it, credit history, right? Who, living in the United States and now increasingly in the developing world, if you want access to credit, all what you need to prove to them is that the state and the institutions have watched every transaction that you have made. They have a record of it. And based on that record, you can get a good interest rate. So the global economic system now is a system in which you have to offer your private financial information, even your private personal information, because whether or not you have children, whether you're married or divorced, do you have alimony payments, all of those factor into whether or not you qualify for credit. And that is his reading of the panopticon now having become natural and that people willingly want to be a part of it, want to be part of that surveillance mechanism 
that gives them a history within the system so that they can access whatever it has to offer. So I think that's really an interesting take on the concept uh, of the panopticon. Then in one of the chapters he talks about uh, that the problems that are caused in the developing world or elsewhere because of what globalization does. You know, multinationals come in, they extract resources, right? In order to do that, they either bribe the local law, the government, blackmail them, whatever you want to say, and then they exploit the resources. In the process of doing so, they also create local conflicts. Right? They will probably pit one group in against another that would highlight the resentments. Maybe they had objective differences, but those are subjectivized. Right? So increasingly, those problems are not necessarily connected to the problem of neoliberal capital or globalization itself. No one says that, okay, Pakistan has this Taliban problem, uh, and maybe part of the reason is because within this global economy, the kind of na nation state cultures that are being developed where nation, the nation cannot really take care of so many of its people, maybe that also gives rise to these non-state actors who have power, power of violence, but also power to employ people and who promise a change. So because the United States and the rest of the world and even the national governments in the developing world see it as a law and order situation. So the solutions are always, you know, let's declare a war on terror, let's do this. In Pakistan, you saw the great example of it. A few years ago, we launched an operation called Operation Zarbe Azb, right? Well, it was successful and maybe it was needed, but what was needed beyond that was a restructuring of the economy in which the people who are left outside of the national promise are incorporated within the nation. So that is one consequence of globalization because so many nation states in the developing countries can no longer do uh, what they absolutely need to justify their existence, what they absolutely need to create what Achille Mamembe calls the social debt. So I mean, look at Pakistan, for example, it's under highly restrictive IMF mandates right now. Uh, and so all they are trying to do for the last year or so is to meet that mandate. So what, are, what is that mandate? Raise the taxes, fine. Increase your tax base. Maybe it's absolutely necessary for Pakistan to do that. But at the same time, they do not, they, they neither have the financial resources nor the freedom to undertake really large scale redemptive functions. They can't la launch a social welfare program. They can't really invest heavily in education. So how are you going to bring these people into the system if they don't have access to education, if they don't look up and say, well, the state provides us health care, food, security, right? So increasingly, the states do become security states, right? And so since they cannot promise any redemptive care to the people, they then go and become law and order states and, and they say, we are going to take care of this law and order situation. We are going to take care of the terrorists while absolutely not being able to eradicate the root causes of that problem. And that's what he talks about, you know, towards the end of the book. So, and then he talks about how even that has become a business, right? Uh, incarceration has become big business in United States of America, where human beings are not just punished. There is no attempt at reforming them. They are housed, right? He, he gives an example of the Pelican Bay prison, right? Where criminals, not even all violent criminals, are placed in these isolated concrete cells, right? And somehow they're dehumanized to a level which exceeds the punishment. They have no human contact. So they're just these concrete warehouses for people. And that that is acceptable, right? And there is no uproar against it. So overall, the book, it's a really brief book. It's a really quick read, but it's a deeply philosophical book. I mean, and towards the end of it uh, is, I think, what uh, he makes one of the best statements that he I have ever used. And that is what he says is through uh, you know, calculation and through 
his assumptions, he says, you know, if all the billionaires, and look, this book, there are too many, many more billionaires since this book came out. Uh, he says that if all the billionaires in the world, you know, only kept five millions for themselves and gave the rest away, let's say to an international charity or directly to the people, you know, six billion people move from poverty to a middle class life, right? Uh, but then he also says that, you know, that could happen, but maybe the pigs will fly before that, right? So overall, the book makes us question some of the assumptions about globalization. It makes us see that globalization in itself is not necessarily something that is helpful to all the people, that it does create an international elite who share the same kind of lifestyles, have the mobility to go anywhere they want in the world, but in the process, because so many people are left behind, right, because salaries are not increasing, the workers are not getting more pay because the system exploits the poor, exploits the worker, and doesn't share the wealth that is produces, the wealth keeps getting concentrated. And the state's ability by collecting taxes and then redistributing it is, is seriously diminished. And also state's ability uh, to create more opportunities for the people to bring them out of poverty are, in, are also seriously curtailed because the nation states governments are mostly busy in trying to meet the mandates of these international organizations. And these international organizations like IMF and other, their interest is not that, let's say, Pakistan should develop. Their interest is to safeguard the short-term interest that they have loaned that they have given to Pakistan and to take out interest out of it and to monitor Pakistan's policy so that every step that the government takes is not necessarily in the best interest of their own people, but is in the best interest of the shareholders of IMF it's because they are trying to secure their loan, right? So all of these things come in this book. Uh, I wish I could go page to page and line to line and discuss it with you, but I do highly recommend it, uh, Globalization by Zygmunt Bauman, and I'm looking forward to teaching it next week, and maybe after I've done that, I'll share some ideas of my students and see how they interacted with it and how they read it. Uh, but that's all for right now. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you probably next week. Please, if you like this, do subscribe to my channel. The, there should be a link down there. And also visit my website, postcolonial.net, where I will be posting most of my write-ups about globalization and other subjects. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye.